I'd like to welcome you all to uh, this morning's session, Global Economic Outlook, Trade, Growth and the Commonwealth. And to begin this session, I'd like to call upon the Right Honourable Dr. Liam Fox, Secretary of State for International Trade, uh, to give us his opening remarks. Thank you. Good thanks, how are you? Well, good morning, and let me add my welcome to London and to the Commonwealth Business Forum. It's great to see so many people here with us this morning, and I'm sure it's going to be a very worthwhile and successful event. One of the stated core aims of this Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting is to build a more prosperous future for the Commonwealth, its member states, and all our citizens. Prosperity is, of course, a key marker for human progress. It's obvious to all that an increase in prosperity or the alleviation of poverty at an individual level engenders personal liberty. But prosperity on a national basis can create freedom on a far greater scale, providing the means for states to realize the wider aims of this meeting. I've said many times before that trade is not an end in itself. Trade is a means by which we spread prosperity. Prosperity is the means by which we create and underpin social cohesion. Social cohesion contributes to political stability and political stability is the essential building block of our collective security. It is a continuum which cannot be interrupted at one part without affecting the whole. You cannot choose to have protectionism rather than free trade without there being unavoidable consequences. So if you choose not to have global free trade, do not be surprised if you get increased mass migration or increased radicalization. That continuum applies to all, rich or poor. But prosperity is also the means by which nations can build a fairer and sustainable future. So although that might be the view you would expect from the Secretary of State for International Trade, I believe that building our prosperity is the most important issue of this Chogham underpinning all our other aims. I would even go further and say that prosperity and its economic foundations offer a blueprint for the future direction of this organization. Our members would be the first to acknowledge that the Commonwealth of Nations is unlike any other intergovernmental organization. It's not a military alliance like NATO, nor is it simply a political entity. It's not an alliance based on geographical proximity, nor is it a rules-based international organization like the WTO. Rather, it's a group of nations brought together by the ties of history, culture, friendship, family, and sometimes language. These ties were not created by design, but the Commonwealth is an acknowledgement that as much as our countries have been part of one another's past, we will be an essential part of one another's future. In many ways, this is an approach that stands us in good stead as we meet the challenges of an increasingly globalized world. Increasingly, challenges and opportunities, as well as solutions, will be multinational affairs requiring cooperation that extends beyond the borders of nations or even continents. I firmly believe that the strength of the Commonwealth lies in its diversity. Our members range from some of the largest and most populous countries on earth to the smallest. Such variety presents disparate challenges, but also a wide range of experience. Likewise, the different levels of development of our members should not be seen as detrimental. Instead, it is an opportunity, a chance to use our collective strengths to support our fellow members and help to unlock our collective economic potential. The UK believes that free and open trade is the greatest catalyst for poverty elimination and lasting economic development. And development in the modern era must be about fostering economic and commercial capacity, nurturing new industries in less developed countries, and creating lasting opportunity. The Commonwealth, with all our rich experience and expertise, can lead the world 
in unlocking this approach. Development should no longer be focused simply on giving and receiving aid, but on commercial partnerships and working together to realize our economic potential. And make no mistake, that potential is vast. Inter-Commonwealth trade is currently estimated at around $560 billion, an impressive figure. But as the Prime Minister said earlier, it's projected to grow rapidly to over $700 billion by 2020. And as the United Kingdom leaves the European Union, we have the opportunity to reinvigorate our Commonwealth partnerships and usher in a new era, harnessing the movement of expertise, talent, goods, and capital between our nations in a way that we have not done for a generation or more. Yet beyond the obvious economic advantage, I believe that the Commonwealth has the potential and the responsibility to take a principal role in the defense of global commercial freedoms. In an era when free trade is increasingly threatened by the siren calls of protectionism, we have the opportunity to reject insularity in favor of economic openness and cooperation. It's the UK's ambition to become the foremost global champion of free trade using our economic and diplomatic influence to support free trade. This will mean leading by example, and we're better to begin than with our friends and partners in the Commonwealth. Earlier today, the Prime Minister outlined a range of commitments that the United Kingdom is making to liberalize intra-Commonwealth trade and investment. Foremost amongst these is the Commonwealth Trade Facilitation Agreement Program, a decisive show of support for the rules-based international system that will reduce trade costs and boost economic activity across the Commonwealth. The Prime Minister also outlined the creation of a Commonwealth Standards Network, an exciting initiative which will create a new platform for dialogue and cooperation between national experts and work directly with developing countries to build standards capacity to ensure those benefits are felt by all. And of course, the Prime Minister highlighted the launch of the She Trades Commonwealth Program, an ambitious venture to boost the role of women from across the Commonwealth in international trade, unlocking the economic potential of hundreds of millions of people. But She Trades is only one part of the UK's ambitions for gender responsive trade. As we establish an, an independent trade policy, we will ensure that we create a framework that delivers for female exporters and upholds gender equality. What the Prime Minister also touched on is the need for more and better data to help drive inclusive policy making across the Commonwealth. We need to understand the barriers that women may face in trade. And that's why we're working with the International Trade Center to launch the Global Outlook on Trade and Gender. The first of its kind, this index will provide member governments with the data needed to understand how they can improve opportunities for women, identifying good practice, and tracking progress over time. And these formal mechanisms are only part of our approach. I've spoken already about how the Commonwealth can take a leading role in helping to shape the future of global trade. And what better way to signal our intention than by taking positive action to increase women's role in global commerce and ensure that trade delivers prosperity for all our citizens? And what better way to counter the rising anti-globalization sentiment than by ensuring that everyone has an equal stake in that global economy. Linked to this work is our work on trade and human rights. And I'm pleased to announce that the United Kingdom is supporting the Commonwealth Small States Office in Geneva to build its human rights and trade capacity. Our twofold approach will see technical human rights expertise made available to Commonwealth small states, facilitating their effective participation in the work of the Geneva-based international human rights mechanisms. We will also provide dedicated trade advisors to increase the meaningful participation of CSS in international trade and facilitate their fuller integration into the multilateral trading system. 
The flagship programmes that the Prime Minister and I have touched on rightly have pride of place in our steps towards realising this Chogham's ambition to build a more prosperous future for the Commonwealth. But as Secretary of State for International Trade, I know that we're doing far more to promote trade investment and wealth creation between our member states. I lead a department that was created not only to design a favourable legislative and policy framework to govern UK trade, but also to support British businesses operating overseas, encouraging exports and attracting investment into this country from abroad, and also to promote outward investment from the UK. In the first instance, we're taking decisive action to strengthen our post-Brexit trade relationships with our Commonwealth partners. India and the UK, for example, have collaborated closely to produce a joint trade review of bilateral trade. This groundbreaking work has enabled both countries to clearly identify and understand the trade barriers for key sectors, as well as building relations between us, laying the foundation for a possible future free trade agreement. Both the UK and India have benefited greatly from a joint trade review process and agreed at the Joint Economic and Trade Committee in January 2018 that we should seek to share the experience with other Commonwealth countries. To that end, the review guide will be posted on the Commonwealth Secretariat website and Commonwealth members can, if they wish, use the same methodology to improve trade with other member states. We want the trade elements of this Chogham to become a process and not an event. We are proud of the early success of our intergovernmental work, but as we all know, trade is not conducted between governments, but between businesses. That is why the Department for International Trade is making a concerted effort to improve and expand the commercial links that already exist between the UK and our Commonwealth partners. Our extensive programme of overseas investment support is designed to make it easier than ever before for UK firms to invest in Commonwealth countries. In developing economies in particular, Britain has the expertise to guide key industries from infrastructure to education to healthcare that will in future drive economic growth. And creating these commercial partnerships is clearly mutually beneficial. My department's work involves exploring overseas opportunities on behalf of UK firms and connecting them with potential customers. But we also offer important practical support. UK export finance offers support to UK exporters and to those Commonwealth companies who buy goods or services from the UK. With a total capacity of some 20 billion pounds to support new businesses, buying from the UK offers a certainty that no other nation can offer. In the last year, UK export finance has almost doubled its ability to finance projects across Commonwealth markets, facilitating trade and supporting growth and development across all our members. Their support is also available in a wide range of Commonwealth currencies, from the Australian dollar to the Zambian quatcher, helping buyers to buy British and pay local. We have a formidable offering for Commonwealth businesses, but our proactive support here is mirrored by wide-ranging investment promotion by the UK within our Commonwealth partner nations. The Investment Promotion Programme is a proposed four-year initiative to build the capacity of four national governments, including Nigeria, India, and South Africa, to attract and manage more foreign direct investment. Its primary purpose is to bring the broader benefits of trade that I've spoken about, economic growth, jobs, infrastructure, and education. It will also, of course, serve to strengthen the commercial ties between the UK and some of our key Commonwealth trade partners, creating opportunities for UK exporters in these high growth economies. Such programs hold the key to future prosperity. As we meet to decide the direction of the Commonwealth, 
those countries with the power to shape must not forget the key role that prosperity plays. The Commonwealth may be molded by its history, but our vision is firmly fixed on the future and all the opportunities it will bring. There will be challenges ahead, but we have the talent, the resources, and the will to overcome them. For the opportunities are great and the prizes historic. Truly, there is no limit to what we can achieve. It is our level of ambition that will determine our future together. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fox. Can I now call upon the Honourable Julie Bishop, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Australia, to address us? To be here in London at this Commonwealth Business Forum in the lead up to the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting which will take place later this week. And I'm particularly enthused by the resurgent interest in the Commonwealth. The very best that the Commonwealth has to offer was on display in recent weeks in Australia as we hosted our fifth Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast in Queensland. And over 6,600 athletes from 53 Commonwealth nations and 17 territories took part in one of the most friendly games one can imagine, elite sports men and women competing. And I have to admit that Australia did make the most of our hometown advantage. <laughs> the Commonwealth of Nations, this family of nations, has so much potential. 53 nations across six continents, a quarter of the membership of the United Nations, bound together by a commitment to a common set of values and principles, democracy, human rights, good governance, the rule of law, gender equality, sustainable economic and social development. And at this point, I do want to pay tribute to the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council for building the business links between the nations of the Commonwealth. The private sector drives economic growth and creates job opportunities and thus drives prosperity and security. And the Commonwealth nations have been growing exponentially the GDP of our Commonwealth is now 10.7 trillion US dollars, set to expand to some 13 trillion dollars by 2020. Four of Australia's top 10 trading partners are Commonwealth countries. Our two-way trade with the Commonwealth of Nations is about 152 billion dollars. It's grown by at least a third over the last decade. Australia is an open export-oriented market economy and we have benefited from open and free trade. Australia is entering our 27th consecutive year of uninterrupted economic growth. That is a world record. No other nation has achieved that. Because we know that our standard of living our economic growth depends upon our ability to sell our goods and services into new markets and enhancing existing markets around the world. And we know that you do not get rich selling to yourself. And that's why Australia believes strongly in promoting free trade, liberalised investment around the world. And it's worth remembering the role of the Commonwealth in establishing the international rules-based order that underpins global prosperity today. After World War I, the British Commonwealth of Nations, our predecessor, 
of the modern Commonwealth was at the heart of efforts to establish a global order to ensure that that was the war to end all wars through the establishment of the League of Nations. That, as we know, was a failure with the advent of the Second World War. But we learned lessons. And in the aftermath of the Second World War, there was this collective will among nations to ensure that we could create a world out of chaos. And thus, the international rules-based order was established. That network of alliances and treaties and institutions underpinned by international law that has enabled the greatest growth in prosperity in living memory. Hundreds of millions of people being lifted out of poverty. But this international rules-based order that has served us so well in terms of economic growth and prosperity and security is under strain. It's under challenge. Some nations choose to ignore it. Others cherry-pick what they believe applies to them and what doesn't. And we believe that it is incumbent upon all nations to defend and strengthen and promote that international rules-based order. It, in fact, was a central theme in Australia's foreign policy white paper, which we released last November. Australia, in fact, all Commonwealth nations have been beneficiaries of this international rules-based order. While the United Nations is the preeminent institution, there are many others that support economic prosperity and security, and Australia strongly supports the World Trade Organization in setting up the global framework for free and open trade. We, of course, would prefer to see the lowering of tariffs within the WTO framework, but in the absence of global consensus, we have worked very hard to establish bilateral and regional free trade agreements. And I want to commend Commonwealth nations for doing likewise. We don't have a Commonwealth free trade agreement or a Commonwealth free trade zone as such, but individual members have been promoting through formal regional trade agreements, open and free trade and investment. So Commonwealth nations, through their regional agreements, but also trading amongst themselves, are reflecting the very best of open, free, liberalised trade and investment. Australia can share our experience. For example, we have entered into free trade agreements with major economies in our region, the Indo-Pacific, with the United States, with China, Japan, Korea. This has seen immense growth in our exports and our investment profile. We have concluded a free trade agreement called the TPP-11, the Trans-Pacific Partnership 11, and that includes six Commonwealth nations, Australia, Brunei, Canada, Malaysia, New Zealand, and Singapore. We hope to conclude the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership with the 10 nations of the ASEAN countries, together with China, Japan, Korea, India, and Australia. We have a free trade agreement with the 10 ASEAN countries and New Zealand, uh, and that was lauded at our recent ASEAN Leaders Summit held for the first time with the leaders of the ASEAN countries in Sydney. With the United Kingdom exiting the European Union, we intend to pursue negotiations for a free trade agreement with the UK when the time is appropriate. In the meantime, we will pursue a free trade agreement with the European Union. We have a very ambitious agenda. It includes India, Indonesia. And so Australia is committed to open free trade. In the face of anti-globalisation and rising protectionist sentiment, including in the world's largest economy in the United States, it is incumbent upon us all to extol the benefits of free trade. And I believe that the Commonwealth, individually and collectively, particularly as so many of our members are developing countries, should be leading the debate on the benefits of free and open trade. In fact, we should be the ones who 
extol the virtues, for we have the most to gain. And this group here today doesn't only represent individual nations of the Commonwealth, but the businesses, the professions, the universities, the research institutions, civil society, all of us have stories to tell and experiences to share about the benefits of open and free trade around the world and the need to stand against protectionism. What we can do is defend the international rules-based order, defend that global system. We can speak publicly about it. We can encourage economic integration in our own regions and we can embrace the best business practices that encourage opportunity for women, for girls, because gender equality and gender empowerment is an important underpinning of global trade. So ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the time is right for the Commonwealth to stand up and be a champion for free trade that will benefit us all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister, for those inspiring words. Can I call on the rest of my panellists to please come up onto the stage? Uh, can I call on Dr Liam Fox, Secretary of State for International Trade, uh, Roberto Azevedo, the Director General of the World Trade Organization, Bill Winters, the Group Chief Executive, Standard Chartered Bank, John Denton, Vice First uh, Chair, International Chamber of Commerce and Partners and CEO of the uh, Chambers Westgarth Australia, and Rakesh Bharti Mithal, the President of the Confederation of Indian Industry and Vice Chairman Bharti Enterprises. So this panel is quite um, Australia heavy, and so we'll try not to raise any more um, uh, you know, wor uh, world um, records that, that we've broken. Um, but I, can I begin with you, um, Minister? Um, because you, in your speech, you touched on the lessons that have been learnt post uh, World War II. So if we look at where we are now in 2018, it's 10 years since the global financial crisis. Can you tell us what lessons have been learnt both individually as a nation and also as the Commonwealth? Well, as I said um, during my remarks, we have learned that free and open trade uh, is absolutely essential to growing prosperity and that the anti-globalisation forces and the rising protectionist sentiment that we've seen around the world um, is a recipe for lower growth, less jobs, less opportunity. And so that's why Australia is so adamant about extolling the virtues of free and open trade at every opportunity. If we learned anything from the um, global financial crisis, it's you can't turn back the clock. We are a globalised world. And to raise barriers and to um, put hurdles in the way of continuing that free and open trade is a backward step and one that we won't take. Roberta, in fact, we've redoubled our efforts to enter into free trade agreements mm -hmm. in the wake of the global financial crisis. And so we now have um, virtually all our top trading partners are also bilateral free trade agreement partners. And just quickly, if you could tell us um, what the Commonwealth ha has learned from it? Well, I think the lesson is um, similarly for the Commonwealth nations, um, particularly developing nations. It's so important for us to remember that those who benefit most from free and open trade are in fact those who are on that development path. And I would not like to see the Commonwealth um, turn away from that. Mm. And hence this business forum is so important and the message that uh, Liam Fox has just given us underscores the importance of what we're seeking to do. 
the WTO hasn't delivered um, to the extent that we would have wished, but that doesn't mean we stand still. It means that we should continue with bilateral and regional free trade agreements. And I think that the, the fact that the Commonwealth is embracing this topic so enthusiastically this week is a, a very good sign. On that note, I will bring in the WTO. Um, Roberto, there is often criticism of the role of the, the WTO. I mean, do you think that reform is now needed? Well, um, the world has changed a lot since 1995 uh, when the WTO was set up. Uh, so clearly, uh, there are things happening out there today. Uh, the business environment and the business practices have changed significantly. Um, I am absolutely convinced that uh, something needs to be done um, in the WTO to update it. Um, one example is uh, e-commerce, for example. Uh, in 1995, 1% of the global population was connected. Uh, today, half uh, is already there. Um, and yet, uh, we don't have a specific conversation, uh, a structured conversation on, on the digital economy. On, on e-commerce, which was um, two years ago about uh, $22 trillion. Um, so we, we have to begin to handle uh, this. We are beginning this conversation in the WTO at this point in time. Um, we are very happy with the state of the, of the global economy at this point in time. We, we just saw um, a very healthy expansion of trade uh, in 2017. Uh, we're going to see similar numbers in 2018 and 2019, but all that uh, could be uh, under the threat of, um, of a deterioration if, for example, we do not manage the rising trade tensions uh, that we see today. And I think that the mere threat of um, throwing away or abandoning the system uh, is already beginning to have an effect on the business environment. Um, the latest numbers we looked for March uh, this year already shows uh, that uh, the orders for exports are beginning to decline, and there is no reason for that. Um, the only thing that we can uh, identify is uh, uncertainty, uncertainty in the markets, uncertainty in the business environment because of the trade tension. So I hope that we can um, uh, rally around the system, uh, make sure that it is not uh, forgotten, uh, because um, that is basically, I would dare say, the only thing standing between us and, uh, and a very chaotic um, economic environment. Can I bring in uh, Rakesh just on the point that Roberto has made about the state of the global economy? Because frankly, at this point in time, we're really seeing this simultaneous global growth, whether in the developed world or the developing world. And this is a big deal. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, you know, I mean, if we go back to 2008, the economic meltdown, I think we all were reminded about how interdependent uh, we are of each other. And in the last two years, uh, it seems like that we are revisiting the same uh, issue once again. And uh, most importantly, in the, in the Western world, uh, rising protectionism, including Brexit, I think these are some uh, uncertainties which we see, and I really don't know how are these going to, going to play out. But more importantly, um, as uh, Roberto just mentioned, the global economy has moved up in the last year. And the uh, projections are for the next two years that it's only going to be positive. And uh, within that, I believe India stands as a bright spot, uh, having just closed the year with about 6.6% .6 of GDP growth. And the IMF targets are talking about 7.2, 7.5 next year and going to 8% 2020 onwards. So I think these are positive things. Uh, we will have to wait and watch. But I, I can only say that uh, here lies an opportunity within the Commonwealth to, to look at increasing the uh, trade and services to 1.5 trillion economy, 2.4 billion people, 53 countries. There are so much of synergies which are available today. And I think the more <coughs> quicker uh, we start engaging with each other uh, on bilateral investment treaties, on bilateral trade, uh, it is only going to be getting better for the Commonwealth member countries, and I think that can take away or mitigate some of the risks which, may, which we may have to see later on. Dr. Fox, can I bring you in on that point? Because uh, the Commonwealth is seen as many things, but it's not necessarily seen as an economic entity. How do you 
make that? How do you sort of make that happen, or is it make it view, not in, as an alternative to the EU, for example, but but uh, as an, as a platform in its own right? Well, it's a it's a very large proportion of the global population. It should be as large a, 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 a share of global GDP and prosperity. And the question is that is how do we unlock the potential uh, that exists, not just now but in the future? If you look at the age structure of the population in the Commonwealth, you'll find that it's got a very large proportion of young people. That we should see not as a threat, but as an opportunity. So how do we open up these economies? How do we share the experiences of the more developed economies, particularly in areas like professional services, so that we can help mature some of our trading partners more quickly than they otherwise would get? And Roberto uh, talked about reform of the WTO, perhaps the greatest uh, reform that we have is to get a global free market in services, the way that we've established that in goods over time, and how do we get that increased liberalization upon which many of the developing, more developing countries will depend. Commonwealth offers us uh, an opportunity to be able to be at the front of some of those arguments. And, and it and as hasn't been, though, has it? It hasn't, hasn't been. been a unified voice no. uh, calling for reform for these multilateral institutions. And I, think, and I think we should be. I think it's time now for the Commonwealth to step up yeah. and take a leading role in, in the defense of, of global free trade. Our prosperity in the future will depend on us getting that right. And as Julie said, we do live in a much more interdependent world than ever before. And when you think about events of recent years, whether it was 9-11, a terrorist event, whether it was SARS, a naturally occurring event, whether it was the tsunami in Japan, whatever was the, influencing the global economy in a different part of the world very soon influenced us. In many ways, I think in the 21st century, the whole concept of over there becomes redundant because what is over there today will be over here tomorrow. And we need to learn um, that to manage that interdependence. I mean, I've often thought that if as I said, that if Francis Fukuyama had called his book the end of geography, not the end of history, he would have been much closer to the mark in terms of the world in which we find ourselves today. So and we are a very important part of that global community, and we should not wait for rules to be passed down to us. We should be part of the rule making. We are a huge part of that future global economy, and we should have the self-confidence to go out there and shape that global economy in a way that we know is good for us, but is good for the world outside too. Bill, do you think that the Commonwealth can become a meaningful trading bloc post-Brexit? Well, I, I think as a practical matter, it already is a meaningful trading bloc. Mm. I think there, there are very strong uh, sets of values, uh, as, as Dr. Fox mentioned, rule of law, uh, with, with, with many underlying commonalities, and some infrastructure that supports that. Uh, I think that the role that, that uh, Senator Charter Bank plays is one small part of that infrastructure, which is just creating connections between uh, sources and uses of capital. And uh, I think that the Commonwealth as a body no doubt can contribute to that which is already there in terms of leveraging the, the core commercial values uh, that are in place today, uh, establishing ever stronger uh, relationships, uh, both bilateral and multilateral and, and sub-multilateral, so we call it regional uh, trading relationships, can all contribute to, uh, to, to positioning the, the Commonwealth at a, in a much more substantial way in terms of promoting growth across the, uh, the, this, this group of 53 countries. So, yeah, it's certainly something that we're committed to. Uh, I think we bank one way or another uh, over 90% of the GDP uh, within, the, uh, within the Commonwealth, uh, as uh, Jose Vanielles mentioned earlier, over half of the countries. Uh, and that's, uh, th that, infrastructure, that institutional infrastructure is, is in place not just in banking, but also uh, in, in infrastructure development, in, in uh, engineering design. The, the key export uh, uh, and import arrangements that exist are in place today. So I think the institutions exist. Uh, they need to be leveraged and harnessed, and the, and the Commonwealth can certainly help that happen. John, I'm going to throw you right into it, because you've described the Commonwealth community as space junk. Um, how does it come back into orbit? Well, thanks. Uh, I didn't realize I was going to be the heretic on the, on the panel. You can be the disruptor. Uh, we always need a disruptor. Well, well, well maybe I'll put it in context. Um, I, I don't often spend time in Geneva, but I was in Geneva and I was just struck, particularly post um, the, the election of President Trump, post uh, Brexit, how in many respects people were just going about their business as though none, the context hadn't changed. Uh, and I worried a little bit that the institutions that support the very international rules-based order that um, Julie described so effectively in her opening remarks, uh, 
perhaps when living up to the expectations that's required. Um, and one of the observations I was making was that organizations, institutions that fail to actually reform, fail to make themselves relevant in the context in which they operate, and sometimes be a little predictive of it, will actually end up as space junk. And the, the, the reason I use the term in the context of international organizations, because they're too hard to close down. So they just stay on. People still go to the meetings, but the effectiveness is not there. And if you think about it, uh, the big four contours that we see at the moment, one is around this, you know, uh, the huge shift of economic power to uh, Asia, our region, uh, where uh, the foreign minister and I come from, and Rakesh. The second is really around the challenges of those institutions to live up to supporting that change. And we're seeing the consequences of that coming out in the communities uh, around there in the sense of some of disengagement from the, from the uh, growth that was wanted. And then underlying all that is this extraordinary technological change. It, and it's not so much the amount of it, it's the speed of it. And all this doesn't kind of work as well. What I was really pleased about, and I shout out to Lord Marlin here, I mean, and I've always seen the Commonwealth, um, its great strengths is people to people. Uh, obviously, the Commonwealth Games is a great exploration of that. Uh, but also business to business. Business to business. Um, one of the th things that's always attracted me about participating in the Commonwealth was, frankly, finding a way to work more closely with India, South Asia, and Africa. It's not to say I'm not interested in CARICOM, but I certainly am. But it's from a business person, it's an investor as well. These were very fine features. Now the opportunity emerges, and maybe it is the changing geostrategic mix where Brexit makes the UK more focused on providing leadership in the Commonwealth. Because that's in the end to transform an organization. You actually need leadership, you need to have a vision, and you actually need to have the capability and the energy to do it. Um, and you've got to make certain you pick a couple of things that are going to make sense. And I'm delighted to hear, and I would be arguing this, that the Commonwealth is focused on creating almost a hub on trade facilitation. That will make a difference. The second is giving voice to this issue around the digital economy. This will also make a difference. I mean, these, this kind of mucking around on digital economy has kind of been going on for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And now it actually forced, it was only being forced along because of the context in which the WTO operates by a coalition of the willing, effectively led by a few, and I'm pleased to say that Australia will convene the first discussion, I think, on April the 14th in Geneva. And one of the organizations I'm involved with, the ICC, will provide the private sector input. But it's just taken too long. Mm -hmm. And if you can't maintain a relevance in, on contemporary issues that make a difference, the WTO itself could also be at risk. Pleasingly, under the leadership of uh, Roberto Azevedo, that will never come to reality. <laughs> but that's, that's the context in which I made the comment about the Commonwealth. Roberto, can we talk about this drumbeat of a, a trade war? I mean, are we at risk of sliding into a trade war? Well, um, a trade war begins uh, in a very subtle way. Uh, you, you don't start a trade war voluntarily. Most of the times when you, when you do it, uh, you expect your action to be the last one on the, ch on, on, on the chessboard. Um, so somebody is doing something wrong or unfair, and then I'm responding. Um, and, and, and then the other side is going to respond. Now, we're living in a world where two-thirds of global trade is somehow connected to the global value chains. So when you, when you respond to an action by another country unilaterally, or when you take action at some point in time, it is almost a certainty that you're going to be affecting a third party or, or, or another country. Um, I saw a study recently about um, a scenario where you had the US and China in a full-fledged trade war, and the study was on Australia. Uh, precisely, and how would Australia be affected mm. by a trade war between those two countries? And Australia would lose about 7,000 jobs, um, having nothing to do with it. Um, and that, that is the reality that businesses face. Today, uh, an action taken in, in one country affects businesses everywhere, mm -hmm. um, let alone the uncertainty. Um, when you uh, import a product today, it is very likely that some components of that product were manufactured in your own country uh, or somewhere else. That is the reality for business. A business today in this interconnected world um, need uh, predictability. They need certainty. They need um, to know that their investment 
uh, is going to observe certain rules. It's going to have some kind of predictability in the future. The moment that you take that away, the whole economy is, is affected. Um, like I said, you don't even have to have a trade war. Just the possibility that you are going to have it is already affecting uh, business decisions. It's already affecting the, business, the, the global economy. Minister, can I bring you in? Because uh, you know, Robert has talked about this interconnected global economy and the impacts of a trade war would have on a country like Australia. I mean, is there concern that we could be potentially sliding in but if unilateral action is taken? It is in no nation's interest for there to be a trade war, uh, not between any nations, let alone the two largest economies in the world. We are all dependent uh, to a greater or less ex extent on trade and investment with the United States and with China. The United States is our largest economic partner. It's our largest foreign direct investor and our second largest trading partner. And I just point out that since we signed a free trade agreement with the United States back in 2005, our trade has increased by 50% and our foreign investment by 130%. Likewise, China is our largest two-way merchandise trading partner. I, I think China is the largest trading partner for about 120 countries around the world. So it's in no one's interest for there to be any sort of trade war between these two great economies. We have been urging our friends in the United States to ensure that any differences that they have with China are resolved peacefully through the WTO um, framework. And that's why we are so supportive of the international rules-based order. Of course, it must evolve. Of course, it must uh, change with changing circumstances. We're in a more congested, competitive, uncertain world than ever before. And so the international rules-based order must take that into account. But fundamentally, this is a set of rules that determines how nations behave and towards each other and it ensures that um, powerful nations don't act unilaterally in their interests against the interests of smaller nations and the like. So at this time, where there are tensions in the trading relationship between the US and China, it's more important than ever before that we all speak about the importance of resolving trade differences through the WTO. Uh, the United States has done it in the past, and the United States has actually done quite well out of a number of the um, dispute resolution mechanisms in the WTO. So we urge all parties to resolve their differences through that framework. Do you think the United States has a point that China needs to be reined in? I understand some of the issues that the United States raises, particularly in relation to intellectual property and the like. Um, but again, these are all matters that have to be resolved through the um, mechanisms that have grown up um, by the WTO. And I can't see any benefit in tit-for-tat tariff wars between the two great economies. Yes, they, they all have points of difference, but you resolve them through the global framework. Dr. Fox, to what extent do you think we're at a turning point in terms of globalization where uh, we're no longer behind opening borders or removing trade barriers, but actually doing the opposite? Well, it's very easy to focus on the US-China dispute and the imposition of tariffs, but if you look across this decade, what we've seen is the gradual introduction of non-tariff barriers. And amongst the greatest culprits are the G20 countries. According to the OECD, back in 2010, the G20 countries were operating about 300 non-tariff barriers to trade. By 2015, they were operating 1,200 non-tariff barriers to trade. So there has been a gradual silting up across this decade of trading freedoms, and very often it's hidden behind regulatory or uh, consumer safety mechanisms, whatever. We need to reverse the whole process. We need to understand that if the WTO didn't exist today, we would have to invent it. Um, and what we need is, as Roberto says, an updating of the WTO to look at the way that the global economy has transformed. E-commerce has been mentioned. Now, we had a very interesting small group this morning, and we were referring to uh, a paper that had been published uh, and we discussed in Geneva at the WTO. If you look at companies that trade only, only offline, 
four out of five are run or owned by men. If you look at companies that trade only online, four out of five are run or owned by women. What does that tell us? It tells us that e-commerce is one of the phenomenally empowering economic tools that we have. And if we go back to our arguments about the connection between prosperity, stability, and security, it's essential that we achieve it. But here we are, and the point to be made by John, we've gone well into the era of the digital economy with no, no ground rules set on e-commerce. We've got to up our game. We need to catch up with the way that the global economy ought to be run. And remember that the alternative to a rules-based system is a deals-based system. And a deals-based system may suit some of the biggest players. It will not suit the rest. And for an organization like the Commonwealth, that really spells trouble, which is why it's not just a, you know, some sort of abstract aim that we should be defending the rules-based system, as Julie said, or that we should be striving to create greater commonality in trade. It's actually part of, of our, our existential interests. We need in the Commonwealth, if we are to unlock the potential of trade amongst more developing countries, to have an environment that is permissive and liberal and open. Um, and we need to fight for it because the failure of that rules-based system could potentially spell disaster for our countries in the Commonwealth. Before I open up to the floor, because we're limited on time, I, I just want to ask Rakesh about the digital economy and how disruptive it's been. Well, I think uh, this is something which is uh, developing very fast, including in India. And if we, if we see the Digital India program, uh, including the digitization of government services which are being provided online, has really changed uh, the lives. Uh, things have become much, much easier. Uh, but more importantly, uh, when we are looking at digital digitization, when we are looking at uh, future technologies coming and now uh, intervening into trade and services, I think we need to also uh, uh, put a robust mechanism around it. Cybersecurity is going to be an extremely important uh, area where I believe uh, the, the Commonwealth uh, member countries need to really engage with each other. Um, and I, I can tell you, I mean, at, at CII, while we have nine centers of excellence, uh, looking at the focus which the government is putting on, dig on uh, Digital India, we are setting up a Digital Transformation Center of Excellence, which will ensure that the industry gets that, uh, if I may say, uh, the, the equity and the, the, the uh, areas where, where, where they need to focus. But I think more importantly, we, the other area which I want to bring on here is, while we talk of trade and services, I think the social uh, uh, security, inclusive agenda is yet one, again, big issue which the member countries need to see. I am a firm believer that you cannot have islands of wealth and islands of happiness if you have turmoil around you. And therefore, I think clearly we need to deeply integrate uh, the, the population, especially the 2.4 billion population within the Commonwealth uh, nations. And this is a work in progress. Every country is engaging into it. And I believe a lot more work needs to be done uh, around that. On that note, I'd like to open up uh, to the floor. I believe there are some uh, microphones going round, and I'll take uh, three or four questions, uh, and then we'll bring it back to the, the panel. Uh, gentleman right at the very back had his hand up first, um, and then I'll, I'll work my way through. Are, are there, yeah, so could we um, have people perhaps go to the different uh, numbers? Oh, there, there we go. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Alan Lyon from the UK ASEAN Business Council. I'd like to ask um, John Denton and perhaps Minister Julie Bishop their thoughts on um, what lessons can be learned from APEC. John, you were an APEC Business Advisory Council member for Australia. Uh, what lessons can uh, the Commonwealth learn from your involvement at the APEC Business Advisory Council? Should there be a CBAC? Uh, and how can uh, the Commonwealth take lessons from APEC? Thank you. Thank you. And I believe there was a uh, question A and C. Good morning. My name is Rajiv Arora. I represent Kenya and would like to table a question on Africa. Uh, more importantly, as we can see, Africa is now having a big challenge of growth and place which can really bring the food basket on the table, having the largest landmass and young population 
for industrialization. How do you perceive, and especially to the Minister for Australia, what would you be looking Africa as a supply chain in developing trade? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, B, please, and, and then we'll go to C. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Ian Black. I'm the CEO of the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade in Vancouver, Canada. My question is for Dr. Fox. I was picking up on Minister Bishop's comment about completing a trade agreement with Europe and then when the time is appropriate, one with the UK. I think it would be interesting to understand from Dr. Fox some of the opportunities that are available for trade agreements with the UK in a post-Brexit environment. Mm -hmm. Great. And C, and then I'll bring it back to the panel. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon, panel. My name is Darren Jones. Uh, I'm from a company called KMT, who are delighted to be one of the Commonwealth first program uh, trade champions. I'd just like to ask the panel about a year ago, I was at a similar, somewhat smaller Commonwealth meeting, and a trade minister from a developing nation said to me when I was banging on about free trade, there was no way he was going back home to tell some poor farmer that he was going to take a lecture from a rich white boy and make him poorer. Now, whilst I was pleased to uh, be offered some shadow of youth, the, uh, the sentiment of that, how are we going to use this week and use the Commonwealth to put once and for all to the sword the idea that free trade makes people poorer? Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll bring it back to the, uh, the panel. The first question was to you, John, the lessons that can be learned uh, from APEC, the lessons poorer. the Commonwealth can learn. Well, well thanks very much. And, um, Really, the question really works, works from the assumption that Apex, APEC has a, a, it's a successful example of a, of a regional group. Uh, from a business perspective, um, the focus of APEC on underpinning the creation of the supply chain a revolution in Asia Pac was actually, its, I think, its signature piece. And in many respects, it's kind of boring work because underlying all that is actually hard discussions over many, many years on setting standards. This is the very rules we talked about before. And it's actually, those standards are set not actually by bureaucrats, they actually were set, and this is the strength, I think, of APEC, by engaging with the business community, the end users, in the actual creation of those standards. And there is no doubt that one of the great underpinnings of the 1990s and early 2000s in terms of the economic growth of Asia Pacific was actually underlined by the supply chain revolution. Question for APEC, like everyone else, is where did it go to after that? And of course, supply chains change to, to, to different models now because we moved to value chains, et cetera. But the lesson I think that came out of it, and it is a modality that's used, is probably threefold. Um, the first is, and this is something that the leadership recognized in APEC, was that you actually had to bring business into the leadership group. Um, so uh, in Osaka, I think at about 19, 96, I'm not quite certain, 1995 I think it was, there was a decision to actually elevate and create this business advisory council. And it wasn't just a talk fest, the idea there would be business people on it and they would engage in this sort of stuff. And this is what it did. We have a series of task force that actually focus on those sorts of things. So elevating business to the same level. By the way, that's where the G20 B20 started. The B20 was originally a horizontal with the G20, bringing business directly into the tent because that was how it was seen to get the, the best and, and most accurate information on how to support the, the policy shifts to enable economic growth, talking to the private sector. Of course, that's been diminished over the last uh, 10 years, uh, to like a Christmas tree of events that occur around uh, the G20. But those two aspects, first of all, was around really recognizing from a business perspective something that had to be done, engaging with business on policy setting, elevating the role of business into APEC. But the other piece, which is often um, dismissed as um, the weakness of APEC, is probably its, its strength, which is actually the voluntary nature of it. It's actually not a binding organization. It's actually relationship-based, and actually it's where people make commitments to each other. And by the way, there's competition between the member economies. And so you actually have a series of benchmarks that are put out. You actually use a lot of transparency in order to drive change. And that's what the Business Advisory Council does. And the last piece that comes out of that voluntary area, you don't have to wait for everyone. There's a process in APEC, which is called the Pathfinder process. I suppose in a way, Roberto, it's a bit like the, co the coalition of the willing now on e-commerce at the G20. 
And if only people had learnt the from the examples of APEC many, many years ago. These pathfinder groups are basically groups of economies who want to do something driven by either their business community or a need, and they gather together and they are allowed to go ahead with it. And then others, if they like what's going on, join into it. They're quite good mechanisms. And the final piece, I suppose, is, um, though it's yet to be fully tested, the membership is a little less um, uh, uh, large uh, compared to um, the Commonwealth and certainly compared to the WTO. So keeping very focused on the membership uh, and actually including people who are actually going to get involved in opening up economies and have a political commitment to it is helpful. And I suspect from, from, from time to time reviewing the membership list as well because a few of the economies in APEC are not living up to the expectations of the other economies. I can say that, I don't think the Foreign Minister can. <laughs> Bill, I, I, I'll put this question to you. The question was, um, how can we get over um, this idea that free trade makes people poorer? I think that the overwhelming evidence is that free trade makes the globe wealthier, but equally that certain groups are displaced uh, or affected. And I think it's, it's the role of, of uh, local societies, government and private sector, to address these displaced groups uh, and, uh, and, and address their concerns. Uh, Retraining is, is one critical component that can be provided by the private sector that has been relatively lacking. It's come from the state, uh, and it's been inadequate in some cases. Uh, phasing periods uh, have been very useful as well. Uh, but the idea that we can stick our heads in the sand and, and assume that, that uh, because our grandfathers were farmers, therefore our grandchildren will also be farmers, is, is a misplaced notion. And we, give, we need to give people the opportunity to adapt over a period of time uh, with the proper support uh, and I think there's a, there's a critical role for governments, obviously, in this regard, but there's a critical role for the private sector as well. Uh, many, many, many societies have gone through this, this, uh, this evolution successfully, and the societies as a whole have come out much better off. And there's no reason to think that the, the current uh, coterie of, of less developed countries or subsets of economies that are residually less developed uh, should, be, uh, sh should somehow be protected in some particular way, which has the net effect of only holding them back. Dr. Fox, I'll, I'll bring you in because obviously a lot of the people here, um, one of the things that they're thinking about is Britain's role post-Brexit and the opportunities that would be available. Well, if you look at the available data, um, the IMF say that 90% of global growth in the next 10 to 15 years will be outside continental Europe. It gives you an idea of where the United Kingdom needs to be if we want to access the markets that will provide our prosperity for the next generation and beyond. That's not to say that the European Union will not remain an important trading partner with the UK. It will be. But the EU's share of UK exports has been diminishing from 58% back in 2006 to only 43% today. So we need to look to see where uh, there is growth in the global markets. Um, as we leave the European Union, our first aim is to ensure stability with our trading partners. So those countries with whom we have an agreement by virtue of our EU membership, we want to see those continued as bilateral agreements. We are continuing those as technically as possible. En route to new bespoke agreements, which we hope will be at least as liberal as the ones that exist today. Then we have the potential for new trade agreements, uh, for countries where the EU doesn't have a trade agreement. Currently, the EU doesn't have an agreement, trade agreement with the world's biggest economy, the United States, the world's second biggest economy, China, the world's third biggest economy, Japan. Um, <laughs> and th this is quite a long list. Um, we uh, currently have 14 working groups with 21 countries and have begun to scope out future agreements. Um, and we will be unhindered by some of the restrictions that the EU currently has. Now, we've mentioned how many times already the digital economy. One of the reasons that the trade and services agreement has not been successful uh, and been completed is that the European Union has objected to ideas of free movement of data. Now, our view would be that you can't move goods and services in a 21st service economy without moving data at the same time. And while the European Commission and 24 EU members are in favour of greater data movement. Four countries, France, Germany, Slovenia and Austria, have effectively restricted that. We will not be restricted by those and therefore will be able to include, for example, 
digital chapters and any future free trade agreement that we would have. Again, opening up and helping to liberalize uh, that economy. And the United Kingdom is not looking inwards as a result of Brexit. We see it as a huge global potential. And let me give you one, just one little statistic on how, what the magnitude of change is. By 2030, China, one country, will have 220 cities of more than a million people. The whole of the European continent will have 35. It's food for thought about where growth is coming um, and where we will need to focus our efforts if we're to achieve the level of trade and prosperity that we want. If I can just bring you in briefly, Rakesh, to that point. Um, do you think that the Commonwealth can be uh, perhaps like a, a chapeau for UK-India relations, for example, post-Brexit? Yeah, because absolutely. all eyes will be on India as well in the next few days. Uh, absolutely. I, I see that uh, huge opportunity, especially in view of the Brexit. Uh, my view is that the current uh, trade between India and UK at $18 billion is, is very, very small. Mm -hmm. I think there is such a huge potential which sits between the two countries. And I was very happy when uh, Dr. Fox talked about the uh, review of uh, trade uh, agreements and trade policies, which uh, uh, you know, jointly India and, and UK has done, and that will probably become a role model for other Commonwealth countries. Uh, there are huge opportunities. The, what we need to see here is we must have stable policies. And I'm just not talking of India, UK, I'm talking of the Commonwealth member nations. Uh, because ult ultimately that impacts uh, you know, investments. The, the second most important is the market access. I think every country gets into bringing in artificial trade barriers, including India as well, uh, in some of the sectors. How can we minimize under, these, uh, under, the, under the free trade agreements? And I think more importantly, the mega regional uh, uh, you know, business frameworks are more or less at the, on the back burner. Free trade agreements have not worked. Uh, it, it's benefited one and not the other. And I think it's time where we need to see that the FTAs are a win-win situation for the two nations who are uh, engaging with each other. But just to, uh, if I may take the point, uh, the gentleman talked about free trade, uh, uh, have more poor people to grow, uh, sort of uh, the numbers go up. Um, 1991, India opened up post-liberalization area and uh, era, and I think new wave of uh, uh, sectors, new wave of enterprise came in, and uh, billions of people have moved out of the poverty line because there have been entrepreneurs who came and who, who got the opportunity to set up businesses. And I think more importantly, we, we need to be seen as also as corporate citizens. I can tell you, corporate India has responded very well on, the, on spending 2% of the average last three years of profits under CSR. Almost in excess of $2 billion come into the economy on making social impact where it is needed, education, health, and so on and so forth. So I don't really agree with the gentleman uh, point over there because, of course, the industry's job is to create wealth, but it's also its job is to create wealth for all the stakeholders around, uh, give employment, and more importantly, see where we can handhold and bring up the sections of society which need it the most. And just, uh, we only have a few minutes to go, and there was a question raised about um, Africa and the challenges of growth uh, on the continent. So I don't know who wanted to address that particular question, just on the back of the whole notion of being inclusive. Well, um, as far as uh, Africa is concerned, I think we're seeing a major uh, undertaking. Uh, the notion of uh, a continental uh, area, I think, is something that should be supported uh, by everyone. Uh, certainly in the WTO, uh, we see African integration as a stepping stone uh, towards uh, further uh, integration between Africa and the global economy. Um, industrialization in Africa uh, is a desirable goal. I think diversification of those economies is absolutely fundamental. Um, the question is going to be, and, and to ensure, that we don't try to achieve that uh, taking the wrong road. Um, I have seen in the past, uh, in my own continent, uh, in South America, um, a a, com a discussion uh, back then whether uh, ho how to make sure that the integrative processes did not become um, uh, fortresses. Therefore, why, how do you use that as a step to open up and not close down 
uh, to facilitate uh, the, the integration and the industrialization of the continent. I think these are very fundamental and very basic concepts that need to be clear uh, in the minds of those who are behind this initiative that the integration of Africa is, is an important component of integration into the world. And uh, if we don't lose that perspective, I think we, we might be losing time and going backwards. But I think um, as far as the WTO is concerned, whatever we can do uh, to facilitate the trade facilitation agreement that we struck a few years ago is going to be extremely helpful uh, because although, uh, you know, um, they are neighboring countries sometimes in Africa, it's easier to connect to Europe or to other markets than to themselves because even infrastructure and the, the um, customs facilities are not uh, well, well integrated. So I'm, I'm very supportive of this uh, moment that Africa is uh, undertaking and I hope that it will um, achieve the goals that they are seeking. But this is not just the responsibility of the international community, this is also the responsibility of Africa. It's the responsibility of African governments to provide a system of governance that allows the global trading environment to be able to provide the maximal possible benefit. It's up to the international and more developed countries to recognize that we should be aiming to allow people to trade their way sustainably out of poverty, not to depend on aid from more developed countries and the more that we can do to create sustainable um, trade, the, the better. We also need to understand the value that outward investment from the wealthier countries can help develop some of that capability. Um, and I think that we need to shift some of our attitudes and there's an always incredible um, criticism of, for example, uh, corruption, um, in, in some African countries, we should see that as a failure of systems. People will pay someone because the system is not working properly. And if we can actually make systems work better, if we can assist, trade facilitation agreement is a very important example. If we can reduce friction at borders, if we can make those systems operate better, there is much less opportunity for things like corruption. We, we can by our efforts to make the systems work better and our assistance to make systems work better, reduce some of those opportunities um, that, that come uh, with poor governance. So we all have a part to play. If we want Africa to succeed, we have to do our part and Africa and African countries need to do their part similarly. It's a joint enterprise and the results will be equally rewarding for us both. On that, quickly, yeah. Just quickly, but, uh, as an infrastructure investor, the other piece in Africa is that enabling opportunities for uh, infrastructure assets to become available is actually incredibly important. And part of that, the, I suspect, goes to this whole issue about how do you create an environment which is conducive to the private sector and for long-term investment? Um, we have, and everyone involved in the investment community around infrastructure, there's a lot of money available. But the problem is to actually match that to the right quality projects, ensure the capabilities there, and frankly, make certain if you need to get your money out, you can get it out during the life of the project. And that requires a deepening, a lot more discussion on capital markets. And frankly, that does involve the international community and the G20 should be doing more on this issue. And of course, the point is that global capital is so mobile, so agile, it will go to the location that is most attractive for it. And this is a lesson for us all, but also given that we're talking about nations in the African continent, that you must make your environment as, tra as attractive as possible to global capital. And that comes down to the regulatory environment, uh, the transparency, the accountability, the good governance. And the examples, of course, in answer to the gentleman's question about how can we convince people that uh, you don't make them poorer by opening the, their markets, we have witnessed the greatest economic miracle in living memory, which is China. And China's economic rise came about as a result of opening its economy to the world. It's lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty by virtue of an embrace of liberalized trade and investment. And China is now one of the strongest proponents of open um, and free trade. Uh, likewise, Australia, we are um, 53rd in terms of population in the world, with 24 million people, but we are the 13th largest economy in the world. Yes, we have natural resources. Yes, we have um, wonderful 
uh, coal, iron ore, uh, uranium, you name it. But we have encouraged foreign investment in Australia to ensure that we can grow our economy and provide jobs and opportunities for all Australians. And it's a recipe that history has shown works. And on that note, that Australia is the most brilliant nation on the planet, we'll have to end it there. <laughs> thank you. Uh, can we please thank our panellists? <laughs>
The birds are eating the plastic and they are dying. The fish are eating the plastic and they are dying. And humans are eating fish and therefore they have also got plastic inside them. We are seeing it now, plastic pollution, all over the world in the highest waters of the Arctic, hundreds of kilometers from any habitation, we are seeing plastic pollution. We're seeing it now down around the edges of Antarctic. We're seeing it on the surface of the water. We're seeing it right down at the bottom of the depths of the ocean. We are now finding plastic in the tiniest form on life on Earth, in zooplankton. And we're finding it, if you do an autopsy on a great big blue whale, you will likely also find plastic inside the blue whale. It is an absolute catastrophe. Let me take you from the Indian Ocean now all the way down to the Maldives. For those of you who've been to the Maldives, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. These are some of the most beautiful islands on the planet. The problem with these islands is that these are the lowest lying islands in the world. The majority of them are less than half a meter in height. Now, as the polar regions are beginning to melt, sea levels are rising, this country is beginning to disappear. And here's the hard inequity of it. The people of the Maldives have done virtually nothing to cause climate change, but now they're facing it literally on a daily basis. I felt so strongly about this that I decided to do a swim across the whole country from island to island to island. And I'll never forget diving into the water. It was literally like I had dived onto the set of Nemo. Underneath me are all these beautiful tropical fish, the gold and the blues and the yellows and the turquoises. Underneath me is a beautiful little white-tipped shark, this great big manta ray. The coral reef is beautiful. It extends now for 10 kilometers to the next atoll. I went back there last year, so 10 years later, and it was like I had swum over a rubble. It was just rubble everywhere. The water temperature has gone up just a few degrees. The coral has died. The fish have disappeared. And with it, the protection which these coral reefs provide the islanders. And when I went there, this is what I saw. Islanders building defenses to protect themselves from the waves and from the storms. Let me take you from there now down to the South Atlantic to Robben Island. As a young swimmer, this is where I cut my teeth. Uh, there are two wonderful things about swimming Robben Island. The first is that whenever you take a right-hand stroke, all you see is Table Mountain. It's one of the most majestic mountains in the world. The second is what is beneath you. This island has a colony of African penguins. And if you want to feel really inadequate, go and swim amongst a colony of African penguins because they can really swim. That colony, so we have African penguins, obviously, in South Africa and Namibia. We did a census, the last very big census. The first very, very big census was done in 1920, where they had a million pairs of African penguins. Two years ago, there was another census. A million penguins have, cr have crushed all the way down to now around about 26,000 African penguins. These penguins are on the edge of extinction. The thing about a penguin is a penguin is an indicator species. A penguin doesn't fly. You can count them fairly accurately. And what you can tell from the penguins is what is happening in the rest of the oceans. These oceans have been so badly overfished. Climate change is now moving the anchovy and the sardines so far away from the penguins they can't swim the distance, their chicks are dying. As I said, this species is on the edge of extinction. And let me take you now to the final place, all the way down to Antarctica. Just off the edge of Antarctica is this island called Deception Island. Deception Island is a caldera. That means it's a volcano which has sunk into the sea. Underneath is still a live volcano. You can sail into the volcano, and I'd never swum inside a volcano before, so I obviously had to go for a swim. I will never, ever forget the moment diving into the water there in Deception Island. Underneath me were literally hundreds and hundreds of whale bones, jaw bones, spine bones, rib bones, some of them so high they were almost the surface of the water. This place, this island was infamous. 150 years ago, this was the epicenter of the whaling trade. The whales would be captured out at sea, they'd be dragged into the, into the island, there they would have the, the, the blubber taken off, melted down, put in these vats to oil the industrial age. Ladies and gentlemen, let me take you now back to that quote by Ernest Hemingway. Let me just quickly say that we first started going for the, the seals in Deception Island, and then we went for the whales, and then we went for the Antarctic toothfish, 
and now we're going for the most tiniest life on this earth, the krill, on which every single thing in the Southern Ocean relies. So let me take you now to that final quote. How on earth did you go bankrupt? How did it happen? Well, in the oceans, it was gradual, and then it was sudden. And it's happened in my lifetime. It's happened on our watch. The Arctic melted on our watch. The pollution in India happened on our watch. It all happened when we were alive. And if you think it's just going to be impacting those specific countries, please think again. If you think that the melting of the Arctic is just going to be impacting Canada, it's going to be impacting all of us. It'll be impacting London with rising sea levels. It'll be impacting Dakar in Bangladesh because of rising sea levels. And the pollution in India, it's not just going to be kept in India. That's going to break down into microplastics, and then it's going to go all the way down the east coast of Africa to Kenya, to Tanzania, to Mozambique, and all the way to South Africa. And then the coral reefs, well, do you think that the people of the Maldives, when their country is disappearing, are going to stay in the Maldives? Those people are going to be looking for a home. They'll be looking to their neighbors in Sri Lanka, in India, and Australia for a place to live. And the overfishing in the Southern Ocean, you think it just impacts South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand, and Fiji? Impacts every single one of us. We here, assembled here today, come from Commonwealth nations. We're 53 nations, and we're held together by our history and our past. But what also brings us together is that almost all of us are maritime nations. Almost all of us have got coastlines. And so our real common wealth is actually our oceans, and we rely entirely on our oceans to survive. I've been swimming for 30 years, and in 30 years, I have seen our oceans change. And in 30 years, I have seen us do virtually nothing to solve this crisis. Virtually nothing has happened in 30 years. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to take action. We need to take action now. Every single generation is going to be faced with these issues. In the 30s and 40s, it was the Nazis. In the 50s and 60s and 70s, it was decolonization. In the 80s and 90s, it was apartheid. The single biggest issue facing us right now, by a long way, is the health of our planet and the health of our oceans. I've come here today to urge you, to urge you as business leaders from around the Commonwealth to please do absolutely every single thing that you can do to ensure that your businesses are sustainable. And when I say sustainable, I mean environmentally sustainable. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very, very much. Well, quite rightly, that gets the loudest applause of the whole morning. Uh, by the way, <clears throat> if Lewis asks you to do something, be inclined to say no. I was in South Africa with him oh, about two years ago, and his latest thing is surf kayaking. He said, come on, let's get out. You must come surf kayaking. I said, I'm a 60-year-old man. I, you know, I can barely hold two hands together. He said, no, no, I'll put you in the back of the boat of the world champion and you can come in the other boat, and we'll go out to Robin Island. He said, just be very careful we don't turn over, because there are a lot of sharks out there. Luckily, it was too rough to go to Robin Island, so we went off um, another place, and uh, I assure you it was the most extraordinary experience coming back into a beach at uh, 35 kilometers an hour, and by quite a coincidence, we ended up on a penguin beach, absolutely drenched, but the most sensational experience. But Lewis. I'll do it once, but not too often. But Lewis, thank you so much for coming over. It's an amazing story that you tell, and I've heard it a few times, but it still is absolutely extraordinary. Now, uh, as you all know, we had the uh, Commonwealth Games in uh, Queensland, which I had the pleasure of attending. And uh, running alongside that Commonwealth Games was the Commonwealth Innovation Forum, which uh, our friend Mario Panisi, who's one of our new board members, uh, kindly attended as a symbol of a sort of handover of where we're going with innovation. Hang on. There seems to be... Uh, uh, have, have we got it? Uh, come up, Maria. 
uh, he has brought over the baton from the uh, Commonwealth Games, uh, not been dropped by the English team for a change. Um, and uh, that is a really wonderful symbol of a handing over of innovation from uh, uh, Queensland and Australia in general, a fantastic forum you had, Mario, and Thank giving you. that to us so that we can carry on the innovation message going forward. So, Mario, huge thanks. It was a fantastic. Thank you.